Okay, any questions tonight? Yeah. Why do we say by a chulu three times on Friday night in Shemun Asriah after and at Kiddush? Yeah, so the question is that uh, we say Vayichulu, the paragraph of Vayichulu Shemayim, uh, three times Friday night. We say it in the Shimon Esrei, and we say it uh, right after Shimon Esrei, and then we say it again in Kiddush. Uh, so there are really uh, two, two different reasons, although they're related. Uh, one is that uh, since we're going to be celebrating Shabbos with three meals, so the same way... Suda Shalishas, we say Mizmul David three times because it's connected each meal of Shabbos. So we say Vayachulu for each meal of Shabbos. Now the obvious question you're going to ask is, so why don't you say Vayachulu once at each meal instead of three times Friday night? But it's kind of, uh, you're like declaring ahead of time that you're going to be honoring Shabbos in those in three ways. So you say Vayachulu three times. Uh, but there's another reason, which is, is an indirect reason. That is, let's look at the, the function of it, meaning uh, Vayichulu is part of the Amidah of Friday night because the prayer of Shabbos will incorporate that paragraph. Now, when you say Vayichulu afterwards, you'll notice that it's part of what is called uh, Me'en Sheva. That actually means it's an abbreviated Chazara Sashatz, right? That, did, you, did you notice that? In other words, uh, the Shemon Esrei of Shabbos has seven brachos. And we normally do not have a Chazar Sashatz for Mayrif, right? There's no Chazar, right? There's a Chazar Sashatz for Shachris and for Mincha. There's no Chazar Sashatz for Mayrif. And the Rush says the reason is because we paskin that the Shmon Esrei of Mayrif is optional. It's a Minog now, you have to do it, don't skip Mayrif. But originally it was optional. So Chazar Sashatz is to be mighty people who don't know how to read. So therefore it was thought for Shachras and Mincha, their obligations, we have Chazar Sashatz, but not for Arvis. But some say that Friday night, Davening Mayrav was a Chiv, and therefore we put in Chazar Sashatz. So the first Vayichulu is the Shimon Esrei, the second Vayichulu is part of Chazar Hashatz, and the third Vayichulu is Kiddush. So each, each one has its own reason uh, for Vayichulu. By the way, just as an aside, the Mugin of Ram says that, based on the Rambam, that the requirement of Kiddush on wine, or bread, or the requirement of Kiddush where you're having your meal is only Drabanan. The Oraisa, your Yotze, with words about Shabbos, even without wine, and even if without Suda. So the Mugin of Ram writes, therefore, that a person is Yotze, the mitzvah of Kiddush to Oraisa, with the Vayichulu in the Shemon Esrei, and the requirement of making Kiddush again when you get home, or in the dining room, is a Rabbanon Dika requirement uh, because of Kiddush al Hayayin or Kiddush B'makam Suda, or both, both, both reasons. So that's what the Rambam says, and based, uh, well, well, uh, well, well uh, again, yeah, the Rambam, okay, just to differentiate the Rambam of the Mugin of Ram. The Rambam says, Kiddush on wine and suit is Drabanan, and to rice your yotze with words. The Mogen Avram says, that will allow Vayichulu to be the Kiddush the Araisa. So based on this, we don't, we, we're not able to get into all the lumbus right now. The native Yehuda has a famous, famous psak that a man who davens Mayrev is not able to make Kiddush for his wife who didn't daven Mayrev because the woman is Chayeves and a Torah Kiddush, and the man is only chayev in a drabanan kiddush, and the same principle that says if you're not chayev in a mitzvah, you can't be motzi, also applies to someone that's only chayev drabanan cannot be motzi a daraisa. So if the man davens myrev and the woman did not, the woman must make kiddush for herself. The Mishnah Bura says we do not paskin like the native Yehuda because he says, among other reasons, if the man knows he's going to make kiddush at home. He did not have kavana to be yotze with Vayichulu, and therefore he still remains a da'oraisa. Or some approach it the opposite way. If the man is yotze with Vayichulu, the woman is yotze with lighting Shabbos candles, or maybe even saying good Shabbos, which would make her a drabanan. So either they're both da'oraisa or they're both drabanan, and you don't have the asymmetry problem of the man being a drabanan and the woman being a doraisis. That's a fascinating machlokas regarding that. Another a side thing, again, that you didn't ask this question, uh, you know, the Mishnah Rura brings 
and many people are, are knowing this, that when you say Vayachulu after Shmon Esrei, you should say it with another person. Because you're testifying that Hashem is the creator of heaven and earth. And whenever you do Eidos, you're supposed to have two people. And therefore, you'll see, well, you'll see in the base matters, uh, someone who davened uh, a little longer Shmon Esrei will go over to somebody, can you say Vayachulu with me? Uh, this, is the, this is the Psak of the Mishnah Bura as to what is the appropriate Hanhaga. But the Chazanish actually said no, because the Chazanish said, if, if a carrot, it's actually a negative thing. Because if you're implying that you have to give testimony on this, that's Ke'ilu, it's not a Dover Pashat. Meaning the very fact that we're saying, oh, we have to give Eidos that Hashem created the world, is a steer to the fact that this is such an obvious thing. Yeah. Yeah, you're correct. Uh, Prusbal, according to one opinion, is, is one example. Um, yeah, uh, wait, are, you are you learning the circuits of Prusbal now? You're, are you not sure? Okay. No, I don't know if there's any other. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't know if that, because they're pro proclaiming, but I don't know if that, that's much for three. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, why would you Badafka need three? Because usually they're not going to vote on it, but, but you are correct. The Mishnayas are, are very mashma, beferish that Kiddush HaChodesh requires uh, three, they're all from the Sanhedrin, three uh, smuchim who are made, and that's why it actually says that um, if, if uh, two of the Dayanim you know, saw the moon, so they have to be witnesses, and then two more Dayanim are added to the third guy, and they make, they make the basin. So it's clear that you need, I think you need three for that. Yeah. So all the time you hear people saying, with, with seriousness or without seriousness, Oh, like this is a sign from Hashem, like whatever. I, th this thing happened. Now I see it as, as my sign to do something. How, what are we? How are we allowed to do that? Because none of us are really like that. Like, oh yeah, we can interpret things as signs. And if there are really, because I know there are real signs. Like, what, what's happening with Hamas is a sign that we should up our Torah and all that. So, how far can we go with that? Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, you got to be very, very, very careful. On one hand, we, we have the Gemara in Brachos. The Gemara in Brachos says, Befeirish, that if a person has Yisurin in his life, a person has difficulty in his life, whether it's sickness, illness, loss of job, so that's called a sign from heaven, Yifashvish B'masav, he should look into his deeds. And then it mentions, uh, if he can't find anything, he should assume that's because he's not learning enough. So people ask Akasha, well, what do you mean? It says, he looked in his deeds, he didn't find anything wanting. So what do you mean? He then assumes Bittal Torah. That, that's what he was looking at too. But the answer is no, because if you're not learning enough, you're not even going to notice uh, what you did is wrong. Okay. And then, uh, so, so, so clearly, Chazal do have the approach that you look at the things that happen in your life or the life of the Jewish people, and you're supposed to try to derive some type of message. What is God telling me? Uh, how is my life off course? Uh, what is my mid-course correction? So for sure, that's legitimate. But you've got to do it with a lot of humility, because in the absence of Navua, we honestly don't know what the implication is. So, uh, you know, so you look and you tr see what you can improve in, but you don't look at it like a sign. It's not like an omen. It's not like a superstition. It's not like a sure. It's not like a sure thing. You know, in Eretz Yisrael Befrat, I think uh, we have maybe more of a tendency to be looking for the signs, uh, maybe because there's more messianic fervor here and the like. But, you know, it's sometimes uh, it gets a little too far, so, so especially when it involves blaming other people. So if something happens, so one group will say, oh, this is because of the Avera that these people are doing. And another group will say, no, it's the Avera that you're doing. No, uh, it's the Avera that they're doing. It's usually not the Avera that we're doing. You know, you know, it's always like looking at, at other people. So you've got to be very, very careful. You know, you can see now how important Nevoah was for Klal Yisrael. You know, we think the Nevi'im only gave the big messages about war and peace. The Vilna Gaon says, in the days of Nevoah, you could get a private appointment, just like you'd go to a therapist, Lahabdil. You can go to a Navi, and these were not even famous Nevi'im. Chazal said at one point there were like a million two hundred thousand Nevi'im. 
Now, not all of them made it into Tanakh. Only 48 men prophets and seven women prophetesses are in Tanakh. So what happened to the other hundreds of thousands? They had private practices. You'd go to them and say, hey, what do I need to fix in life? This is the Vilna God says. And the Navi would give you like private hadracha. That's a wonderful thing. You know, you mamish are told from, through Hashem, what is it need that I need to work on? We don't have nevuah today. So as a result, and Chazal say, uh, the only people that have nevuah are shaitim, are uh, idiots, like, you know, the town idiot that sometimes says prophetic things. In fact, I tell you, I mean, I, you know, that really is true. You know, I, I had a, I had a very, very close friend, actually, from go all the way back from grammar school, kindergarten, you know. And unfortunately, um, I, I don't know exactly what happened, but he, he went crazy. He's crazy. Uh, and once in a while, uh, he'll be giving, like, public speeches, like a crazy person does. And I remember, you know, seeing him and uh, listening to him. I mean, you really can't listen to him for more than, more than three minutes because it's so incoherent. But at some point, I, I once was really startled in the middle of this incoherent rant that made no sense. There were things that were startling me, like prophetic or true. I mean, the idea that prophecy is sometimes given to the, the crazy is actually true because it's so intermingled with everything else. But there are things there, or, or children even. So I, I agree with you that you've got to be very, very careful. And you have to understand that you're just hypothesizing you're just guessing, you're doing the best you can, but you cannot make any definite conclusions. But the good thing is this, the good thing is, if you, it, it's kind of no loss, if you use it for your tshuva and for your tikkun, then, you know, there's no downside, because if it's the prophetic message, you know, Baruch Hashem, and if it's not, you're learning better, or you're davening better. So I think maybe if you approach it that way, it's kind of more healthy and balanced. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's a fascinating question. You know, I remember uh, the first Art Scroll book, uh, I think it came out 1975, uh, kind of the 70s. And really, it was supposed to be a one-time project because Rav Meir Sladowitz, um, you know, Levracha, the, the founder of Art Scroll, Art Scroll was, he, he was an artist. He was a graphic artist. He did kasuvos, he did things. And uh, a good friend of his was Nifter, so he thought he would put together an anthology on Megillas Esther in English as a one-time thing. He worked very hard for Shloshim just to put it together. And then he would go back to Ksuvas. Well, the rest is history, as they say. Uh, the Megillah was very, very popular. So they decided, OK, we'll do the five Megillas, and then we'll stop. Then it kept on going and going and going. And then Shas, I remember the first time somebody told me our school was doing a Shas. Masechus uh, Makos was the first one. So I didn't believe it. Uh, shas, what do you mean a shas? <coughs> how, how are they going to do a shas? But, no. but they did Bavli and they did Yushalmi and Medrash and it keeps on going and going and going and going and going and going and going. Ad Kadei Kach, that art scroll is like the biggest Marvitz Torah uh, maybe in, in history. So I remember this. Uh, there used to be a magazine called The Jewish Observer. I'm not sure if any of you ever saw it because it's been defunct for a while. Uh, the editor for many years was Rav Nissen Walpin, who lived across the street here in his retirement, and now he's not alive either. And I remember that initially everybody was saying, Art Scroll, this is the most wonderful thing that we bring together, you know, uh, Talmud and Medrash and rabbinic literature in English. So somebody wrote a letter saying, remember the three days of darkness, actually coming up next month, in Teves. As, you know, 8th of Teves, 9th of Teves, 10th of Teves. So besides the fast of the 10th of Teves, which is connected to the Beis HaMikdash, the Gemara says that this is what happened when Talmai HaMelech, the Egyptian king, commissioned 70 elders to translate the Torah into Greek. And he put them in 70 different rooms. And with Ruach HaKodesh, they all came up with the same translation. And this is called the Targum Hashivim, the translation of the 70, or uh, the Greek word that's used is the Septuagint. It's abbreviated in scholarly literature, LXX, which is the Roman numeral for 70. Uh, we don't use it much, 
well, first of all, it's in Greek, but, but they actually have Hebrew translations of the Septuagint. We don't use it that much. Uh, it actually had more of an influence on Christianity than Judaism. A lot of the Christian understanding of the Old Testament came through the Septuagint. Now, the Septuagint made the Torah accessible to the Jews in Alexandria who were very illiterate, very illiterate and very assimilated, and they, they made this a big, big simcha. But with respect to our Chazal, it says, three days of darkness descended upon the world. There was sadness, there was tragedy. Now, what was so tragic about the Septuagint, right? What was so tragic about it? So one of the reasons was that by making the Torah accessible in that foreign language, that meant many Jews were not learning Lashon HaKodesh, many Jews were illiterate, and it was chaval, it was a real tragedy that Jews were not connected to Lashon HaKodesh. And that's for a lot of reasons. One is the holiness of Lashon HaKodesh. Number two, any translation can only capture one nuance of the word. We say there are 70 interpretations, at least, of every word in the Torah. <coughs> well, a translator has to choose one. So whether you're translating based on Rashi or whatever you're basing it on, you're only picking one thing, and all of those nuances totally get, get lost. So the writer of the letter was saying, hey, art scroll is a great thing, but remember the Avelis that occurred with the Septuagint, connecting art scroll to that. So I think our response has to be that on one hand, we are very, very grateful that this resource is there for people who need it. Because better to learn from an English than not to learn, for sure. Like we're not gonna say, oh, we shouldn't have these things. On the other hand, it's a chaval. It is a, it is a sad thing that we do need it. And uh, so there's a simultaneous happiness and uh, sadness at the, same, at the same time. You know, um, if you look now, you know, all of you heard of Dafyomi, that's the program where, from Amir Shapiro, started in the 1920s, where you learn one daf of Gemara a day, and every seven and a half years or so, you finish Shas, right? Big, big Siyama Shas. Well, Dafyomi has been growing exponentially the past few cycles, more and more and more and more. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, a lot of people start with brachos and then they drop off with Shabbos and Ervin. But Baruch Hashem, there's more and more staying power, more and more people are staying. And the truth of the matter is, uh, the major contributor, to, uh, maybe Har Smith will not like that I say this, but the major contributor to the exponential growth of Daf Yomi has been the availability of the Art Scroll Shas. That now people, even if they fall asleep, you know, they could chazer the Daf, they could learn the Daf. So on one hand, here in Yeshiva, you know, we kind of discourage it. I know if, if you get caught with an Art Scroll, that's a, a capital crime. Uh, they may cut your head off or, or whatever it is. Okay, and there's a reason for that. You know, we want you to be self-sufficient. But on the other hand, it is a tremendously valuable resource for so many Jews. So I think we can be simultaneously happy and unhappy uh, with it. Now, interestingly enough, this is like, if you're looking for an advertisement, this is like the best advertisement you could get. Um, Rebel Yashiv was caught not using the English art scroll, <laughs> I don't think he read English, but he was re using the Hebrew art scroll. He was looking at the Hebrew art scroll for something. And art scroll somehow got the picture, and they said, even the God of Lajar, you know, uses our, uses our Gemara. <laughs> you can't, I mean, that's, uh, that is a great, great advertisement. Uh, and uh, Rav Yashif said, he says, listen, uh, the people who write this are Avrechim, who are working very hard on each daf, and maybe they come up with something. You know, who knows? They may, may have come up with something. Uh, you can look at an art school, there'll be chidush of there. It's not, you know, I mean, I use art school uh, sometimes. I mean, it's not like uh, I'm looking for a translation, although occasionally I am even doing that. But, you know, usually it's not, you know, how do you translate this word? But they may say some svara or whatever it is, whether it's the Hebrew or the English. And even Rabbi Yashif saw a, a, a utility for himself, not just for us, for himself in that type of work. Somebody was madame, it gave such a beautiful mushal. It mentions that um, Kalal Yisrael is compared to fish for a lot of reasons. You know, we're in the water, there's no ayin har on fish. But one reason why Kalal Yisrael is compared to fish is this. Fish are totally enveloped in water. And yet, when they see drops of water hitting, you know, the raindrops hitting the water, they rush up looking for the water, even though they have water all around them.
<coughs> so a Talmud Chacham, even if he's surrounded with Torah, if there's any little extra bit of Torah he could get, he runs up like, to try, like a fish trying to get the raindrop. So overall, I think Art Scroll does a lot more good than not, but, but you are correct. There is a reason to be a little concerned uh, for it. Yeah. Here's a sentence. Yeah. I believe I've heard the Rav say in the past that when someone takes a Chumar upon themselves, it's going to detract from another spiritual area or something along those lines. That being said, why would anyone be allowed to take on a Chumrah unless they're already beyond perfect in every other category? Are there times that you recommend taking on or Dafka not taking on a Chumrah? Yeah, so the question of Chumrah, I, I did mention this idea uh, in the name of Rav Dessler in the Micht of Meliyahu, where he writes that we are people of limited spiritual energies, although our energies can expand with exercise and the like, uh, and therefore, if you kind of, when you invest your kochot in a certain area, it's likely to take away from some other area. Uh, so, for example, the person who will get up for tikkun chatzos, uh, right, is likely to have less of a good chakras in the morning, etc. So Rav Zetler said, therefore, you've got to be very careful in taking things on beyond the halacha, because it may take you away from obligations. So if you're going to be grouchy at your wife by staying up till 2 in the morning, you know, the shalom bias might be more important. So the question is, therefore, so if that's the case, it's like a bed sheet, right? A bed sheet that's too small for the bed. Like every time you pull it, in the, or a tablecloth, every time you pull it in that direction, you know, something gets uncovered in the other direction. But I would say this. I, I would say that Rav Dessler is not saying this will happen 100% of the time. He's saying this is a risk that a person has to take into account. So it may very well be that sometimes chumras may be a good thing, particularly when you want to break a, a particular habit. There is a concept, like the Rambam says, normally you're not supposed to go to extremes. Uh, right? You're supposed to be the middle. But the Rambam says if a person has, let's say, a very, very bad habit, let's say selfishness. So the Rambam says, you know, you're not supposed to be selfish, that's obvious, but you're also not supposed to give away everything. Chazal say, for example, you shouldn't give away more than one-fifth of your money to tzedakah. Right? You've got to be the middle between um, total selfishness and total not caring about yourself. You've got to be somewhere in the middle. But the Rambam says, temporarily, if you're trying to work on yourself, you need to go to an extreme in order to get yourself to the middle. The example would be if you have a tree that's supposed to grow straight, and the tree is somehow bent totally in the other direction, it's not going to help just to bring the tree up to the middle because it'll keep on bouncing back. You've got to pull it all the way to the other extreme, assuming it can bend, till at some point the two pressures will bring it in the middle. So chumras can often be a transitional way of character improvement, of midos improvement, uh, with the ultimate goal of being in the middle and not necessarily being machmer. So that would be one Indian. Uh, the other Indian is that as you grow in your ruchnias, you may have more energy that can be devoted, meaning your energy, your spiritual energy level grows. But that requires that you be slow, that you be deliberate, uh, that you be thoughtful, and that you monitor yourself. Just like they tell a person uh, you know, uh, who had a heart condition or whatever, you can exercise, but you've got to watch yourself carefully to be sure you don't overstress yourself. And then eventually maybe you can build up to a, a better level. So th that's what chumras are. Chumras are, are challenges in your life, and you have to be sure that they don't jeopardize your health uh, in terms of spiritual matters. But I don't think Rav Dessler is saying there's no makam for chumra until you're perfect. <laughs> if that's the case, there would be no makam for chumra at all. But you do have to be careful. Uh, more is not always better. Uh, th th I think that's the important point. Uh, the important point is to say that sometimes do what I'm supposed to do in a better way, more kavana may be more significant than doing more things. You know, the Mishnah says already, by tefillah, tov ma'at b'kavana, meharbe shalom b'kavana. It is better to do a little with kavana than to do a lot 
without kavana. Of course, Rav Huttner had a famous paraphrase. He says, Tov ma'at shalom b'kavana meherbe. Better to do a little without kavana than a lot without kavana. Okay, so that's, that's our situation. Okay, but Chazal were hoping that with a little bit I would do it with, with kavana. So that's the thing that we have to think about a lot. Uh, we tend to think about quantity rather than quality, and, and that, that's going to be a big, big mistake in life. Yeah. Um, what's like the, like the historical differences in like payas, right? For, like, for example, you have know, or curly payas, or you have know, straight payas, or whatever. But also, like, you know, lit, like, like literature, you know, literature like, payas. Ones, right? and then, like, the yeah, ones, yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I don't know if I have a complete answer to this. You know, uh, the, the, the origin concept of payas is, of course, uh, based on a lav, a lo sase in the Torah, that says, lo sa kifu pa'asra sheichem. That actually means don't encircle your head, meaning the idea would be that if you were to cut the payas very high, then your hairline would be like a circle around your head. And that's an issue of the Arisa, and that requires that you leave a hair growing from the top of the head to the roughly the bone, which is the upper bone of the jaw. That's the bone around in the middle of the ear and the like. Uh, and otherwise, there's a lay sakifu. Now, uh, why is there such a lav in the Torah? We don't really know. The Rambam says because it was the chok, it was the practice of, of, of uh, Avodah priests to cut their hair that way. And indeed, uh, if you ever look at uh, the old English friars, Friar Tuck and Robin Hood, you'll, you'll see indeed there was this rounded idea of cutting, cutting the payas and the like. But whatever the reason, the basic halacha could be kept very simple, like, like people who don't wear payas. You just don't cut, you know, you, you uh, leave hair growing here. You don't cut it down. Uh, there just has to be uh, some hair here. But the notion of not cutting it at all so it grows you know, from the top of the head uh, down. Uh, this was a later hanhaga that many people have. Uh, so the concept, though, of long payas is actually very, very old. Uh, the Rambam refers to the minog of Taimanim, of Yemenites, having long payas. This is way before Hasidus, all the way back in his time. Now, this wasn't the Rambam's own minog, but he says there was such a, a minog. Among the Makubalim, <coughs> payas is very, very significant because the Payos is somehow a conduit of divine wisdom, kind of like it's like your cable, like your uh, USB cables or, or whatever, whatever it would be. And therefore, you don't cut the payas uh, even if you're leaving enough hair to comply with the halacha. Now, once we go beyond that, it's a little difficult to figure out uh, what the origin is. Why some have long, very long, some have curled, some have straight. Uh, the Yushalmi payas are, I guess the Yushalmi payas might be the easiest to understand. That's simply being machmer in the halachanas. We don't want to cut too close, so they leave it a little more than a normal haircut would be. So that's probably just a zihirus in halacha to avoid uh, crossing the line. But once you're talking about you know, really, really long payas, that is really not connected to the halacha anymore that's much more connected to Kabbalistic, uh, Kabbalistic ideas. Now, there are two minhagim generally about those who wrap payas around their ear, that many, uh, during Shemona Esrei, they let it hang loose. They uncurl their payas, and they have it hang down. And that's because, once again, looking at the payas as a conduit for divine wisdom and divine mercy, so they kind of, they want to un unentangle the wire so they could be a direct conduit. But I'll, I'll try to look into it a little bit more, see if I can give any more, any more history. The one, the one thing that is interesting is that the Rambam clearly tells us that the very long payas were not an innovation of Hasidim, that it did pre-exist many hundreds of years. Yeah? This is going to sound like kind of a very basic question, but you eat even stumped my rabbi, so I'm going to give it a try. Eating some? I didn't hear you. You even stumped my rabbi, oh, so I'm okay. going to give it a try. Oh, okay. Why would Noah send the birds out of the window to see if the flood waters diminished if he could have just looked out the window? Yeah, <laughs> it is a good question. Like, why can't he just look out the window? Uh, but I think, I think the answer is, I mean, listen, listen. Obviously, Noah is not yet on dry land because uh, he's still in this teva. So the point is that the whole world, 
or at least that's a machlokis, regional flood or world flood, but whatever it is, the, the whole world is flooded, or at least his area is totally flooded. So um, his point is, he knows that where he is, there's still pockets of water. So looking outside is not going to help him, but he wants to know, 10 miles away, 20 miles away, how is it looking there? So I think he needed the birds because that would be his long distance expedition that he wouldn't be able to see with his naked eye. I think we have to assume that with his naked eye, all he saw was water. So in Mela, he just needed to know beyond the uh, vision uh, of his naked eye, uh, he sent them out to see if there's anything. Yeah? Uh, when it comes to tefillin, like everybody wears uh, Rashi tefillin today and uh, some people wear Rabbi Tom. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering before Rashi, what kind of tefillin did people wear? What was general? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously there's no question. I mean, listen, Rashi lived in the uh, ten hundreds, the eleventh century, Rabbeinu Tam, you know, lived into the twelfth uh, century, right? Now, tefillin have been around, were around, for much more than a thousand years, by the time Rashi and Rabbeinu Tam came came along, and uh, it is generally assumed that until Rabbeinu Tam, the tefillin that everybody wore were Rashi's tefillin. I mean, Rashi was the standard understanding of tefillin. So the real question is not how could Rashi invent tefillin. The real question is Rabbeinu Tam. I mean, Rabbeinu Tam's father wore Rashi's tefillin. Rabbeinu Tam's grandfather wore Rashi's tefillin. So Rabbeinu Tam all of a sudden gets up in the morning and says, hey, everybody got it wrong. And this is not just a question of l'chatzchila. You know, if it would be a question of it's better to do it this way and people are doing it with the Yevet, all right, that's one thing. But according to Rabbeinu Tam, if you, if you wear tefillin like Rashi, you're not Yotze the mitzvah. Because the parshios have to be in a certain order. So really it is kind of a, a mystery. Uh, but I think we have discovered in archaeological digs and the like that both pairs of tefillin actually do exist. And therefore the machlokas Rashi and Rabbeinu Tam is not a machlokas that was invented by Rashi or Rabbeinu Tam. It's a machlokas that goes back like from the very beginning. And the question simply becomes, who do you paskin like? Rabbeinu Tam wanted to show that we paskin like his particular view. So if you go with that idea that these were two traditions in Klal Yisrael, and therefore most people followed Rashi, but Rabbeinu Tam felt the other tradition was better, you still have a question, you still do have a question how does that tradition start? Meaning, Hashem gave Moshe on Har Sinai, and actually even beforehand, even in Mitzrayim, in Mitzrayim, the mitzvah of tefillin. Presumably, much of tefillin is Torah Shabal Peh, right? The fact that tefillin are square, they're black. That's not in the Chumash. All of that is from the Torah Shabal Peh. But presumably, Hashem gave Moshe instructions how to make tefillin. Moshe came and he taught us how to make tefillin. So it was either Rashi's way or Rabbeinu Tam's way or actually other ways as well. But it was one of those ways. So the Jewish people are doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. When is the first time that somebody did it a different way? In other words, how does such a machlokas get introduced into the Jewish people? Even if you say it wasn't invented by Rabbeinu Tam, it was much earlier. So, Baruch Hashem, I mean, for, to say Rabbeinu Tam invented a new way of putting on tefillin would be beyond belief. Okay, so this was a much older agreement, uh, a much older disagreement. But the question is, how does, it, how does it happen? If it would be a mitzvah that happens every once in a while, for example, the Gemara says that one time Erev Pesach fell out on Shabbos. And the Chachamim forgot the halacha, do you bring a Korban Pesach on Shabbos or not? Disagreement. And they, you know, of course, then they came to a decision. That's how Hillel became Nasi. Hillel remembered the tradition that you bring the Korban Pesach on Shabbos. But that's okay because that could happen every few years. You know, it didn't, didn't happen that often. So things that don't happen that often, people forget. But tefillin is every day. So it films every day, how do you get that disagreement? It's, it's very, very difficult. Uh, but, but all I can tell you in terms of your immediate question, that these were two traditions that existed in Klal Yisrael all the way back before the Mishnah even. 
and the Machlokas Rashi and Rabbeinu Tam is how we paskin. By the way, uh, it's not just Rashi and Rabbeinu Tam. There are many, many other sheetas about tefillin. Rav Chaim Volodjner asked the Grah why the Grah does not wear Rabbeinu Tam's tefillin to be Yotze all of the deus. The Grah did not wear Rabbeinu Tam's tefillin. So the Grah told, uh, Gra told Rav Chaim Volodjner, if you want to be Yotze every opinion about tefillin, you're going to have to wear 64 pairs of tefillin, not two pairs of tefillin, 64 pairs of tefillin, because we have machlokas after machlokas after machlokas in every single aspect of tefillin. So he says to Rav Tam, I'm sorry, he says to uh, Rav Chaim uh, if you want to be machmer, why are you stopping at two? And if you're not going to do all of the shitas, why do two and not the others? But there is a, among the more famous third variation, there's a tefillin called Shimusha Rabba from the Ga'inim. And in the Chabad Mesorah, uh, only the Rebbe wears Shimusha Rabba. In other words, the Chabad, the Minig is that everybody wears Rashi and Rabbeinu Tam, but the Rebbe also wears a third pair of tefillin that's called Shimusha Rabba from the Ga'inim. Uh, but once again, it's one of the Mesorahs that are, that are brought down. Yeah. When the Mepharshe Hapashat argue with Chazal's interpretations, such as if Keturo is Hagar, if Shifra and Pua were Yochel and Miriam, etc., do they understand Chazal literally, yet still disagree? Or do they simply assume that Chazal were not speaking literally? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Uh, we, w one thing that's very, very clear is that many Mepharshim in Chumash uh, are, are perfectly willing to, uh, to explain things the opposite of Chazal. And this is uh, an accepted practice. Uh, the Ibn Ezra does it, um, the Ramban does it, and even Rashi sometimes. Rashi does it less, but even Rashi himself uh, does it. The Rashbam does it all the time. And the Tosas Yomtev is Mazber, that as long as you're not contradicting Halacha, as long as you're following the Halacha, that Chazal Darshan, you are given Rishus. Who's the you? Maybe even us. You're given brashus to explain, thank you, pshuto shel mikra keneget chazal. So, when it, so one example of, of many thousands of examples would be uh, Keturah, right? Avraham's wife that he took after Sarah died. So Rashi brings the chazal interpretation that Keturah was not a third woman. Keturah was in fact Hagar, and she became a very righteous woman after Sarah died and Keturah is Keturah, her deeds were as pleasant as Keturah's. So Avraham retook or remarried, or maybe married for the first time, uh, uh, Keturah. Uh, the Balai Apshat say, hey, Avraham had a third wife. There was, uh, uh, there was Hagar, well, Hagar's not a wife exactly, but there was a third woman. There was Hagar, there was Sarah, and then there was Keturah. Now, this is more of a problem than other times, because other times when Meforshim explain a Pasuk not on the basis of Chazal, that's not a negation of Chazal. In other words, Chazal might be adding an extra dimension, and therefore both could be true. Something is true on the level of Pshat, and then something is true on the level of Jirash, and a Pasuk could have multiple meanings. So in many cases, when you have a conflict between Chazal and Pshuto Shel Mikra, it's not really a conflict, it's simply an example of both ideas being true on different levels of interpretation. But in this particular example, and that's maybe why the questioner picked that example, this is, bit, this is a bit more difficult, because here it's an either or. Was Keturah a separate woman, or was Keturah the old wife, Hagar? So if you say one, then you're negating the other. Both, both cannot, be, cannot be right. So here you're dealing with a real conflict. So the question becomes, are they simply saying Chazal are wrong, or we don't have to agree with Chazal? Or are they saying that Chazal themselves may have been speaking in symbolic language, and they didn't mean Keturah was Hagar, but they meant that Keturah had the neshama of Hagar, or some type of spiritual connection uh, to Hagar uh, and the like. Well, that's an excellent, uh, you know, that is a very, very excellent question. And I think the short answer is, I don't know, but that may be a way out. Meaning, it's, it's certainly easier in some ways to say that they're not rejecting Chazal, but they're simply telling us the Chazal were not intended to be taken literally, and there may be a symbolic meaning, and that would be a good way out. Uh, but 
you know, we, I don't think we have a definitive understanding of how, how far that works, but I think that's very much a possibility. Yeah. Um, why is it that some topics, such as Yibo Narsaka, have whole Gemara's dedicated to them, and yet the pink fish Gemara, uh, like which discusses uh, forbidden in Taibas, only has like a few examples and a pretty short entirety? So, like, why is it that we have to that? Yeah, yeah. So the question becomes why do some topics uh, in Tyrish Abalpa get so much elaborate treatment, and other topics that are also very, very important uh, are treated in only a few lines. Now, the truth of the matter is, that's not only a question on Gemara, that's a question in the Chumash itself. If you go back to the Chumash itself, uh, there are certain things uh, uh, that are given extreme length and detail. The laws of leprosy, which you have to assume were fairly rare, are very, very <coughs> lengthy. Uh, the laws of Shabbos in the Tyra in the Tyra are very brief, as important as Shabbos is. Now, maybe in Torah Shabbal Peh, maybe it gets reversed a little bit. The laws of Shabbos has much of the Torah Shabbal Peh. Um, but in Shas, uh, the laws of Tefillin, there's, there's no Masechus Tzitzis, there's no Masechus Tefillin, etc. even though we have what are called small Masechus, uh, that are really from the time of the Gaonim, Masechus Tzitzis, Masechus Tefillin. Um, again, I, I, I don't know. I mean, the issue would be that uh, Chazal Armarich, when it's something that uh, you know, we need a lot of chizuk on, meaning things that we might neglect, that we might not pay attention to, tend to be amplified. They tend to be discussed much longer. Other ideas uh, we could absorb with less of an emphasis, and therefore they're, they're makatzer. You know, let's take Shabbos. I'll give you an example. This doesn't directly answer your question. You know, if you think about this, uh, there are 39 malachas of Shabbos. Uh, many malachas are only discussed in five lines. Five lines. Then you take a malacha like carrying, what you're allowed to carry on Shabbos, Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, You have a whole Maseches Ervin, which is largely a very hard Maseches, largely devoted to carrying. You have several prakim in Masechus Shabbos devoted to carrying. Carrying gets many, many, many more dafim than any malacha on Shabbos. You know, Bishal is a very complicated malacha, and Bishal has many, many halachas. <coughs> so Bishal has a few blat, but it's under, it's under 10 blat. Carrying has around 120 blat, right? And cooking is the next biggest one. And that's you know ten blot or twelve blot or something like that. So what's the idea? Why would why would carrying be so emphasized? So the emphasis is Tosfos calls carrying an inferior malacha. Uh, and why is that so? Because most malachas involve changing things. You're harvesting, you're writing, you're sewing, you're trapping, you're killing, you're dyeing, you know, color, coloring it. So you're doing transformative changes. Carrying, there's no transformative change. You're just changing location. So I might have had a hava amina that it's not a big deal. Because it's not really a malacha. Malacha is about changing physical reality. So therefore, chazal were mairich in the laws of haitza'ah precisely to emphasize how important it is. Now, I can't say that I can fully see, well, why would that apply to yibam and, and, and everything else? But that would be a general idea, that when something is important, but it will tend to be neglected, there needs to be a greater emphasis. Also, part of it, too, is that uh, Yavamas, in particular, was a very fertile uh, kind of series of brain teasers. Have you ever learned Masechus Yavamas? It deals with all sorts of complicated family relationships, and therefore, pedagogically, it was a way of strengthening your mind. I, I remember the very first time, actually, Yavamas is not part of the cycle here. The Kailal sometimes uh, does it. But I remember the first time we learned Yavamas, you know, uh, we, we, we called it the Yavamas brain. It takes like a month to get a Yavamas brain uh, because, you know, you're learning it. Every single thing is just, these, these cases just drive you crazy. You just can't remember it. You can't get it. But then what happens is, you know, you keep on doing it, the Yavamas brain kicks in. And many people actually find that the Yavamas is their favorite Masechta, because once you get into it, you love the intricacy. So there is a concept sometimes that intellectually, 
things that were the biggest challenge tended to be elaborated upon. And that's because uh, that was a way of educating people, a way of training people in Torah. But it is a, it is a very good question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing I'm curious about is well, God knows everybody, what everybody's done. God knows the deeds of everybody. God knows everybody's reasoning for it. And it says that God judges the king so that he isn't first, so he isn't angered by uh, the decisions of the subjects and so he can be more merciful. But if, being that God knows everything that's happened and all their reasonings and what, what they're going to say to begin with, what's the point of judging yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a, right, 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 right. Yeah, so this is a reference to the uh, Gemara, Gemara in Avodah Zara and the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah that says when God judges a nation, a nation, what's going to happen to a nation, first he judges the king and then he judges the rest of the people. And one reason why he judges the king first is because the king is responsible for the whole nation and if God were to see all of the sins of the whole nation, by the time he judges the king, there will be anger and there will be fury. And that would be bad because the king is also needed by the good people in the land. So therefore Hashem judges the king before there is haron af because of the sins of everybody else, right? Hashem judges the king first. Mekamei delefush haron af before there is fury. So the question becomes, you know, that would make sense if like God didn't know what the nation did when he's judging the king, so he's still in a good mood, so to speak. But you know, that totally doesn't make sense. HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows ahead of time what everybody did. So if for whatever reason the king is going to take the brunt, going to take the rap, for what millions of people did, when God is judging the king, even if the king is being judged number one, but God will know all of that other stuff, and that may be a source of charenaf, meaning how can you say that by judging the king first, there will not be charon charenaf? Again, that's a very excellent question. Again, I, I don't have a, a, a good answer for it, but other than to say that Hashem follows certain rules. We don't understand this exactly. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, Chazal say, Malchusa Dishmaya Adirakia Ke'ein Malchusa Diara. They say that the way God behaves in Shemayim is similar to the way a court system behaves now. Which means the Charenaf of God is not actualized merely by God's knowledge, which is there in every case, but it's actualized by God's judgment. So until God is actually judging those offenses, they don't enter into the calculus vis-a-vis -vis the melech. Now, I, I hear the question, you know, well, why not? God already knows. But God as a judge is not looking at that yet. And if he's not looking at that yet, that does not enter into his calculus. So it's not the knowledge of Hashem that creates the charenaf, it is the judgment of Hashem that creates the charenaf. By the way, uh, to give you a, maybe a trivial example, this notion that uh, after you look at a lot of bad things, there's a charenaf, and you look at the next person less favorably. I can tell you, I experienced this myself. You know, one of my, when I uh, taught law many, many years ago, a different life, so uh, one of the things you have to, you have to grade exams. And grading exams is, you know, not easy. I'm not, not, I mean, taking them is harder than grading them, granted, but still grading them is not at all pleasant. And uh, you notice right. when you grade exams that you actually get tougher as you go on because you get mad because people keep on making stupid mistakes. So at some point, you, you know, no more Mr. Nice Guy uh, type of thing. So there is this notion that as you're judging things, you tend to get stricter because you have an accumulated charein af uh, that's there. But that's the idea of Melech Venasi, uh, that it's better to be judged first than to be judged later, because when you're judged later, it's the aftermath of an accumulation of anger, of divine, of divine wrath. Yeah. Uh, so a couple questions. Um, first question is, should hopefully be the short one. Um, in this week's Parsha, um, 
Rivka says uh, after she she becomes pregnant, um, and the the Esav and um, and Yaakov are, are both struggling in the uh, in the womb. For example, um, she she davens to Hashem and she says a very interesting phrase. She says, "If so, why am I thus?" I don't really know what Hebrew is, but Lama why why am I here? Yeah. yeah, like if so, why am I thus? So, so I was wondering if the Rav could just give a, a simple shot on that. Uh, and then my second question is, um, do, do, do secular, irreligious soldiers fighting uh, for the Israeli army, for example, in this war, uh, and who are dying, um, fighting to protect the, the Jewish nation, um, do they die all because Hashem, or because they are not religious, and because they aren't keeping Shabbos, and they're not Shomer Mitzvos, do they not uh, die all because Hashem? Yeah, yeah, so let's take the, the first question first. We're simply asking about uh, the meaning of the Pasuk. Uh, Rivka has been married for 20 years. She's still a young woman, because if she got married at three, she's only 23, but okay, but she, she's married for 20 years. No child. She finally conceives, and uh, she has a very disturbing phenomenon that whenever she walks by an Avodah Zara house, there's a kicking of someone who wants to get out, the baby wants to get out, and when she walks by a house of worship of Hashem, we won't call it a shul, they didn't have shuls per se, but whatever, a place where Hashem was worshipped, uh, there was also kicking, so she didn't understand, does she have a schizophrenic son? Uh, does she have a son that's righteous, or a son that's evil? How could it be? Uh, and her problem was this, she didn't know they were twins. When she said, right, she then went to shame, and, and they told her, you have twins. But remember, when she said, Lama Zanochi, this is before, she thought it was one child. Oh. Now, if she thought it was one child, she thought that this would be the tragedy of a person who, on one hand, had strong inclinations for good, but on the other hand, would be following evil a lot. And she said, that's a tragedy. I don't want to bring such a child into the world. I don't want to bring a child into the world who is set up for failure over and over and over again. So what they told her was, they said, no, there are, there are twins, and uh, indeed, uh, the good twin is going to be righteous, etc. So I, I think what reassured her, even though you could say having Asaf is not so much of a reassurance, but apparently it would be better that they would be split into a good and a bad instead of the good and the bad coexisting in a single entity. Now, there are some Mamari Chazal, some unfortunately that actually say that she made a big miscalculation, that indeed the original idea was she was supposed to have one child who would embody both of these struggles. That was the plan. And because she said Lama Zanochi, it got split into two opposite forces. So it may very well be that that was not the intentional thing. Now, the, the second issue about Chayolim uh, who are not uh, Shomer Mitzvos, they don't keep Shabbos, etc. Uh, they're fighting on behalf of Eretz Yisrael, and uh, God forbid uh, they get killed. Uh, are they considered dying al Kiddush Hashem? So uh, this is a point that's come up a lot, but I think there's, some, there's an additional twist to this question than didn't come up elsewhere. Uh, people ask, you know, again, remember, the normal seer of, of Kiddush Hashem is when a person dies because of God or because of Torah. The Goyim go over to you and say, bow down to the idol or I'll kill you. And you say, I will die before I betray God. And that's called dying al Kiddush Hashem. You died for the sanctification of God's name because you were willing to die before you transgress. That would suggest that Kiddush Hashem is when a person has a choice to die or to reject the Torah and live, when I choose to die, that's called Kiddush Hashem. Now, let's take the Holocaust. Now, the Holocaust, a Jew didn't have a choice. Meaning, even if you were to say, I will convert to Christianity, there were Jews who converted to Christianity. I mean, it's not valid, but they converted. They died. They died. So, somebody dies in the Holocaust. Did they die al Kiddush Hashem? when there was no choice that they made, and personally they were not keeping the Torah anyway. So that's, that's a, an old question, meaning are, are, the, are, are the people who die without choice, are they considered al Kiddush Hashem? I mentioned in the past 
that there is a Lashon in a letter that the Rambam wrote, although it's an equivocal Lashon, it's not, not at all clear, where the Rambam says, anyone that dies because they're Jewish, because they're Jewish, I don't mean somebody who dies in a car crash. That, that clearly is not Kiddush Hashem unless it was an orchestrated car crash. But if you die because you're Jewish, the Rambam says that alone qualifies. Also not even soldiers, just like some of the people at the event. For that's, cr that's correct, the event, right, right, right. Now, I would add, however, that I think when we talk about the soldiers, there's an extra dimension, meaning the soldiers are not just the victims who get massacred. And even the victims who get massacred, the Rambam might say they died al Kiddush Hashem. But the soldiers are dying because they have decided to fight for the Jewish people and for Eretz Yisrael. Now that itself may be treated as a sanctification of God's name, that I am willing to give my life for Klau Yisrael. I'm willing to give my life for Eretz Yisrael. So I think that even if you would disagree with the Rambam and characterize every victim as dying al Kiddush Hashem, this may be uh, a Kiddush Hashem uh, for Chayolim, because I think there are, they are literally putting themselves in danger to protect. Now again, as you would expect, people will argue with this. Um, and well, again, we talked about this a few weeks ago by Richa, so I don't want, I don't want to repeat all the, all the details. Uh, there's a beautiful essay, a very moving, powerful essay by Rav Dessler in the Michtav Mi'eliyahu, which will not answer every question, but he, he talked about the massacre. He came from Kellum, but he was in England uh, before World War II. And when he got news of the massacre of the great, great Sadiqim in Kellum, how they went to their deaths, and they had no choice. The Nazis came and just mowed them down. But he said that sometimes there's Kiddush Hashem, the way you face death. Not so much in your choice to live or die, but with the dignity and faith and courage that you face your death. And uh, there was a survivor of the massacre who described how all of the people of Kelam went to their deaths with serenity, with emuna, with faith. And uh, Rav Daniel Moshevitz, who was the Rosh Hashiva, said to them, we are korbanos for Klal Yisrael, and our thoughts have to be pure. And the Nazis loved, one of the things the Nazis loved was they loved to see people panic. They loved to see people beg. They wanted to re, you know, reduce people to whimpering cowards. That was part of the sadism uh, in their genocide. And these people were calm. They were like unbelievable. They were approaching death with serenity and emuna. Ad kach that the executioner was afraid of them. They, they, were, they were like angels. He didn't think they were human. And he said to his supervisor, can I just let these people go? Uh, why don't we just let them go? He said, no. Yeah, but, but even the Nazi was moved by this. So that's a different Kiddush Hashem. That's the Kiddush Hashem of how you die. But again, that's not going to be an answer for every single case. But I think the Chayolim, I think you have a special Nakuda that they're most nefesh for Am Yisrael. According to the Rambam? Yeah. And what about the victims? Also, the Rambam? What about the what? The victims also? Yeah, according to the Rambam, it would even be the victims. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The thing about the army is what I'm adding. I'm adding that I think the army might qualify even if you don't go with the Rambam. But like the Rambam, that would even include the victims. But as I say, the Rambam's Lushan is equivocal. I think it's less definite than people make it out. But, but the Rambam is often quoted for this idea. Uh, yeah. So, um, popular Allah, if someone is trying to hurt you, you have a mitzvah to defend yourself, and similarly, if someone tries to kill you, you have a mitzvah to get up and, and kill them first. Yes. Um, but there's a quote that I heard, I'm sure you've heard before, too, um, better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war, which basically the idea of it is, even if you're not currently in a situation where you have to be a dangerous person, you should be a dangerous person in case you have to be, like, train ahead of time, don't just wait for the situation to come instead of being in the situation and being totally useless. What would be the Torah view on that? Yeah, yeah, so that's an interesting question. You know, obviously, uh, somebody's about to shoot me, so I'm allowed to, allowed, I'm commanded to kill him if necessary. But the problem is, if you're going to wait until, you know, the guy shows up with a gun, uh, you're not going to, you're not going to, you're not going to have a gun, <laughs> among other things. So the question basically is, how much uh, advance prep 
am I supposed to do to put myself in a situation where if God forbid something happens, I will be able to act in a responsible way. I, I, th I think you have a very good point that uh, in dangerous situations, everything is from Hashem, but we have an obligation of Ishtadlus. In dangerous situations, there has to be some amount of advance planning and forethought. Now, people ask me a lot about, uh, should I get a gun? And I try not to answer that question because I, I think it really, <laughs> I'm not going to answer it even now. Uh, I will say, it's always safe to have someone else to quote, that Rebusher Weiss actually t uh, said that he thinks more uh, religious Jews should be carrying guns. Uh, Rav Asher Weiss, who's a very, very, I mean, he's a very, very chashava, uh, a Pisek, really, one of the Gedolei Aposkim of, of our generation. He, he's here in Yerushalayim, Rav Asher Weiss, very famous person. So that was his position. Of course, uh, guns have their own dangers. God forbid children can get hurt. I mean, you have to be careful. You have to have training. That's absolutely essential. Uh, so I don't want to give up sock. It depends where you live. For example, uh, somebody told me they live in Beitar. Uh, and they're the low, lower level uh, of a building, which is immediately adjacent to a hostile Arab village. <laughs> it's not the greatest place to live, but that, that might be an example where I actually told a person, I think you should get a gun. Uh, but Stam, to tell everybody in Yerushalayim to get a gun, I, I'm not sure, but again, I'm, I, I'm not here to pass on that issue. Uh, but the issue of preparing yourself, I think, makes a lot of sense in various ways, whether it's self-defense, whether it's having pepper spray, whether it's having... Um, electric shock things you can put into somebody, little tasers that you can use. I just told a woman that I, I, she could carry it on Shabbos, you know, within, within an Eruv, within an Eruv, because the only time she's going to use it is if somebody is trying to hurt her, you know, so at that point, it's not going to be much her, so you're allowed to carry it, uh, you're allowed to carry guns on Shabbos, you know, it's very good. Again, within an Eruv, uh, that's clearly the, the Pesach Halacha. So, you know, your point is, is well taken, but once again, you got to remember religiously not to attribute your success to all of your preparations. Ultimately, it's only HaKadosh Baruch Hu that's going to save us, but he does require that we take, uh, take precautions. Yeah? Um, so I heard that, I, I, can't, I haven't seen this inside, but I heard that Esau was supposed to be like a fourth, uh, right, that he was supposed to marry Leah. Um, but if he was in the womb and like already, yeah. you know, um, Yep, yeah, uh, there's a medrash that says, this is a phenomenal medrash, that says originally six shvatim were supposed to come from Yaakov and six shvatim were supposed to come from uh, Esav, which would mean actually, this, this, this would even change the distribution among the imahos, and that is, uh, Yaakov would marry Rachel and there'd be six from Rachel or maybe also from Bila six from Leah and maybe Zilpah and the like. And that was the original plan. And in fact, this goes back to the, I don't, I, I, again, I can't be marich at all of this. Why did Yitzchak want to bless Esau? Right? Yitzchak wanted to bless Esau because he knew that Esau had a certain destiny to kind of also be a co-creator of the Jewish people. So the question is, well, what does that mean? Esau was the one that was kicking to go to the Abode Zorah and the like. So the answer is, Yitzchak envisioned that both Yaakov and Esav had spiritual roles, but they were different spiritual roles. David HaMelech describes uh, how you do tshuva as sur meira, turn away from evil, ase tov, do good. He saw Yaakov's aveda as ase tov. Yaakov did not have a strong yetzer hara. Yaakov didn't have to struggle with overcoming base instincts. Yaakov's job was to do good in the world. Esav had the Avaida of struggle. Esav had the Avaida, so Yaakov, so Yitzchak thought, and maybe originally this was so, that he should conquer his evil inclination. He should subjugate it. And that would make him worthy of being an Av in Klal Yisrael. Because Yaakov is teaching us Asay Tov, and Esav is teaching us Sor Meira. The Arizal says, what does the Pasuk say? Yitzchak loved Esav, Kitsayid Bepiv. Now this is actually a little difficult to translate, but Sayid is that which you hunt. Bepiv is in his mouth. So the simple meaning is that Esav would serve Yitzchak food that he hunted. 
which is the Chaira little trivial. I mean, I love Asa because he brings me good meat. By the way, it says Asa was such a skillful hunter because Yitzchak would only eat things that were shechted. So how could he eat uh, animals that Asa had hunted? Asa could shoot an arrow and it would sever the veins in the neck. It was a kosher shechita. Asa could do a kosher shechita by shooting, uh, by shooting an arrow. That's, uh, that was his great, uh, his great skill. So that's the simple meaning. But the Arizal has another interpretation. Sayyid Bapiv is referring to the idea that Esav captured goodness and righteousness, but it was only in his mouth. It wasn't swallowed to spread and be digested in his body. In other words, Esav had aspects of Kedusha, but they weren't fully integrated into his panemius. And Yitzchak thought by giving Esav the bracha, he would be able to integrate that holiness. So there actually was a view that Esav potentially could have been enough, and it was his Bechira, his Bechira, that ultimately caused that to be forfeited. Mm-hmm. Now, this is always complicated, because God knows the end of every story. I mean, God knows Esav is not going to make the right choice. But Hashem allows things to play out. Hashem allows the situation to make that choice possible, even though Hashem knows what the end of the story is going to be. And that was the story of, of Yaakov and Esau. Yeah? Um, how do we know that today we keep Shabbos on the same day as Shabbos Barashas, meaning that today Shabbos is an actual multiple of seven of Shabbos Barashas? Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, maybe uh, we're keeping Shabbos on uh, Monday or, or whatever it is, right? Because... We, what we think is Monday is Shabbos, and you know, uh, you know, I, I I don't know if we have a proof for this other other than the idea that uh, cl- you know there's been an unbroken Messiah in Klal Yisrael. There's never been a time when there haven't been some Jews keeping Shabbos. Again, unfortunately, sometimes a majority of Jews aren't keeping Shabbos, like like you know, even today, uh, maybe especially today. But there was always an unbroken tradition ever since. Matan Torah, and even before Matan Torah, there were Jews who kept Shabbos. So as a result, uh, we just have an unbroken <coughs> tradition, and therefore we assume that we're keeping the right day. Now, there are going to be questions, right? There are questions about uh, international dateline when you keep Shabbos. That's a big, big, it's a huge, huge machlokas. Uh, does Halacha recognize an international dateline? Does Halacha not recognize an international dateline? Because... Um, if you don't recognize the international date line at the particular point, then the day that is Saturday in Japan might actually be Friday or Sunday or, or whatever it is. And that, that is a big machlokas. To the Ada Yomazah, there's a big machlokas. When do you keep Shabbos when you're in Japan or Hawaii or whatever it is? Uh, the consensus actually is, just to, in case you're, any of you are traveling, that uh, you do keep Shabbos based on when it is Saturday. I keep Shabbos in Japan when it's Saturday. Uh, not Sunday or Friday, but still they're going to be machloksim. But other than that, we do have an unbroken, an, an unbroken Masorah about Shabbos. So when we set the calendar, that didn't change anything? No, no, the calendar doesn't change anything. The calendar changes Rosh Chodesh, right? The calendar changes when the holidays might be, because you now have a predetermined calendar as opposed to witnesses who see the new moon. So Pesach might be observed a different day then it might have been observed 2,000 years ago. But that does not affect Shabbos. Okay, Shabbos is not uh, affected by the Jewish calendar at all. Yeah? How do we look at the concept of, like, Gedolim being there? Of, like, for example, if you were to walk down the street and see, like, the, you know, respect to is beating a kid with a, like, a staff or something, what do you, how do we... Are you referring to an absolute, a, a, an actual story? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I mean, listen, uh, th- there, are two, there are two things to keep in mind. First of all, Nobody is perfect. Uh, Shlomo HaMelech says in Kohelas, Ein Sadik Bioretz, Asher Yaseto Velo Yechede. There is no righteous person in the world who only does good and does not make mistakes. Moshe Rabbeinu has Averos too, right? Now, I mentioned, Chazal mentioned four people didn't have Averos. Um, it's interesting, it's not the famous person, it's always the father. Yishai didn't have Averos. Amram didn't have Averis. Binyamin ben Yaakov? No, didn't. Okay, so there are rare 
exceptions, you can count on the fingers of less than one hand. But other than that, the biggest people do have errors. So the notion that if you make mistakes, somehow you can't be a great person is not MS. Great people can make mistakes and great people can do Averis too. That, that's point number one. And that doesn't take away from their greatness. But point number two is that when a great person does an Avera, it'll usually be a much more subtle Avera, meaning to say, uh, just like David, David and Bathsheba, which is described as adultery and murder. Now Chazal say, well, it wasn't really adultery, Bathsheba had a get. It wasn't really murdering her husband. He was chay of Misa because he rebelled against the king. So you do have an achrayis, I think, that when you see a great person who did a sin, to recognize that you may not fully understand all of the circumstances. And therefore, there may be a lot more here than you think of. But in principle, if you ask me, can a god old, um, can a god old sin? The answer is yes, a god old can sin. Um, now, I know. In Hasidus, they sometimes say, can a Rebbe sin? Uh, okay, so, so they say, Rebbe, it's impossible for a Rebbe to sin. I, okay, I, I, I don't believe that either. If Moshe Rabbeinu could sin, then, then a Rebbe could sin. But still, uh, you know, that doesn't take away from a person's, a person's uh, greatness. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Sort of like a part two. Um, when you look at like the Shifte Kuf, right, that they, when they sold Yosef and they, you know, they yeah. sold him and like that, they look at this like huge tumult in the parts of like, yeah. Like right. Like, can't we just say that you know they may have they were you know they were young guys and they made a mistake and they did they did chuba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 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 the question is, given the fact that I just said that even the greatest people can do sins, so why do the Mefarshim make such a big deal to kind of justify or whitewash or mitigate? the sale of Yosef, right? That we're going to see in a few weeks that Yosef uh, was a rodef, they thought, because Yosef was going to cut them off from being connected to Yaakov. And those who cut off my ruchnias are even greater than those who threatened my life. And therefore, they were justified in what they did. Uh, why don't you just say that, hey, they had a bad day. They were in a bad mood. They were angry. So I, I think there is a difference, Me meaning to say uh, this is a very extreme thing. I mean, after all, even, uh, even we on our low madrega, if we did such a thing, we would be treated as very, very evil and depraved people. So I think chazal have a limit, meaning when you're dealing with righteous people, the shift they call, so ain't chinami, we're not going to say they're perfect. They, they make mistakes. And indeed, Mechiras Yosef was certainly a sin. Certainly a sin. I mean, no one is saying it wasn't a tremendous Avera. But we're not going to make it that bad. Because if, I think the test is a very simple test. If it's not something that even I would do, then I'm not going to assume that that's what they did. Right? So I think, I think that would be the common sense approach to it. Uh, yeah. Here's another sentence. Can one utilize a Torah phrase or concept for commercial purposes? Like a catchphrase or something. For example, uh, the Tadiran uh, slogan from however many years ago, Tadiran Velo, Tadiran, Tadiran Kodem, I think is what it was called. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, can you just read, read me the beginning of the question again? Right. Can you use? Uh, can one use a Torah phrase, yeah, can one utilize a Torah phrase or concept for commercial purposes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can one use a, a Torah phrase uh, for commercial purposes? Um, I, I, I think it is improper. Uh, you know, Chazal say you shouldn't use the Torah as a kardum lach borbo, which literally means a shovel that you dig with. And ac according to the strict halacha, you shouldn't even get paid for uh, teaching Torah. Of course, we, we worked out heterim uh, over time. Schar batala. Technically, a person who's teaching Torah is not getting paid for teaching Torah. He's getting paid for not doing something else. So I'm getting paid for not driving a, a truck or, or whatever it would be, right? So, uh, but Meikara did, you're not supposed to get paid for Divrei Torah, you're not, which means L'chaira, you're not supposed to get financial gain directly from Torah. So it would seem along the lines of logic that you would not take Divrei Torah and use it as a means of making money outside of the con So we have a tamer for teaching because essentially that's necessary. Otherwise, you're not going to have teachers of Torah if they can't get any parnasa from it. But uh, other than that, I would say no. So that's one idea, not using Torah for parnasa. 
The other idea is that I think it's a disrespectful. It's a chisarin of kavod atayra to kind of take mamari chazal and, and use them for... Um, now, what's interesting is, though, I could envision reasons where it might be justifiable, where it's a way where your commercial endeavor is encouraging people to do a mitzvah. I mean, let, let's imagine that I have a, uh, a delicatessen or a Shabbos store. I sell special food for Shabbos. So let's assume I put in my advertisement statements from Chazal, again, you do it in Eretz Yisrael, that talk about uh, anyone that is ma'aneges ha-Shabbos will be nitzel from the wars of Gog and Magog. So I'm using the statement to promote my product. But at the same time, you know, it's v'derech musr. In other words, I'm giving people hadracha. They could read the statement and buy food somewhere else. I think that's more, that's more legitimate because uh, you're using the mamari chazal to convey an idea of the Torah, which may help you financially, but it's not like a pun, it's not like a joke, it's not like a late sonus. So I think that might be a legitimate thing to do. Yeah. Today, from Jews can hear good news at several occasions throughout their lives, and very few make the bracha on this Baruch HaTov made to you. Yeah. What is the reason for this? I'm sorry, say again, they hear good news and... They hear good news on several occasions, but very few make the bracha. Oh, very few, yeah. Right, right. So the halacha is when you hear uh, good tidings, uh, there's a bracha that you can make. If it's no, uh, and uh, sometimes it's shechianu. If it happened just to you, if it happened to uh, more people, uh, and the simchas for more people, there's a bracha vatov ametiv. So the question is, uh, why do people not make uh, those those brachas? So really, it, it kind of depends. Meaning, if I hear good news, let's say good news about Israel. Uh, good news. I mean, this is why I live in Chutz I hear good news about Eretz Yisrael. That derech klal is not mechayev a bracha tova meitav. Meitav is of kind of a almost a selfish type of thing. When something happened to me or my family, so certainly whenever something good happens, you give shevach v'hodal Lashem. But uh, these particular brachas are keyed much more to personal or familial uh, simchas and not uh, you know general. Uh, so that's why we don't make a tova meitiv. Like, uh, like some common examples, like you know, a successful surgery or you know, a birth. What, uh, what are, what are just well, uh, the halacha taka is. This is actually one of the mysteries in halacha. It says that when you, when your wife has given birth to a son, as soon as you hear the news, you are supposed to make the bracha of hatov v'hametiv. So you are supposed to make the bracha tova metiv. Now the big question everybody asks is, why do I make a tova metiv only when a son is born? What about when a girl is born? So here's what the Mishnah Bura says. The Mishnah doesn't really explain it, but he offers a very interesting chiddush lahalacha. The Mishnah Bura says, although you don't make a tova metiv upon the birth of a girl, the first time you see your daughter, you see, see, a tova metiv you make even before you see your daughter, as soon as you hear about, I'm sorry, your son, as soon as I hear about the birth of my son, I make a tova metiv. I don't do that for a daughter, but the first time I see my, see my daughter, I make a shechianu. Why? Because mi'ikar adin, if there's a dear friend that you haven't seen for 12 months, you make a shechianu. So a newly born child is not worse than a friend you've never seen before. And therefore, the Mishnah River is mechadesh, it's a chiddish, that you make a shechianu when you see your daughter. So hatova metev, when you hear about the birth of your son, bircha shechianu, when you see your daughter, because he's medameit to not seeing a chaver uh, for yud beis chaydesh. But the question still becomes, why isn't there hatova hametiv for the birth of a daughter? So the reason that uh, Rishonim themselves give is that having a daughter was a source of a lot of anxiety and a lot of worry. Now it does go back a little bit to the historical circumstances that uh, girls, maybe even today, were very vulnerable. They could be abused, they could be attacked. Uh, finding a marriage partner might be very, very difficult and then who would support them? Uh, and the like. Now, based on that, 
again, you have to be very careful, there are a few postscripts, not many, who say that the nature of how women survive in the world today is very different than in Talmudic times, and therefore they were willing to say that Bisman Hazer, we should make Hatova Hameta for a girl just as much for a boy because the whole issue of women not, not, not being, vulnerable, being vulnerable and not being able to have jobs, etc., doesn't apply so much today. So Rav Nachum Rabinovich, Zechorin Levracha, who is a Dati Liumi Rosh Hashiva, but a huge, huge Talmud Chacham, he actually did paskin that you make a tova mate for a daughter, but most poskim take the position that even though we don't fully know the reason, but if this was the way Chazal made the Takana, even if it was for those original reasons, we still stay with that, uh, with that Takana. But it is true that for Leda Saben, you have to make Atova Amit. Yeah. Um, we learned that Shem Benyamin portion of Israel is in the High Mountain, which reflects that Hashem's extra presence in the bringing of Benyamin. And I have two questions, which is, is this presence still in the minds of people in Benyamin today? And also, could you elaborate on any benefits of this extra presence? Yeah, we know that uh, the Chelek of Binyamin, uh, the Beis HaMikdash itself, uh, Yerushalayim, is located, it's divided between Yehuda and Binyamin. The boundary of Yehuda and Binyamin it straddles the middle of the Beis HaMikdash. The Kodesh HaKadoshim is in the Chelek of Binyamin. Uh, the Mizbeach is Binyamin, but there's a part of Yehuda that goes under the Mizbeach. In fact, it's like, um, I think there's a library uh, in Vermont, that's on the Vermont-Canadian border. And for some crazy reason, the border is in the middle of the library. So <laughs> you can be sitting at a desk, you want to check out a book, you got to go through a passport control. They, they put like a passport thing in the middle of the library. So La Havdil, the Beis HaMikdash was somewhat similar. I mean, there was no passport control. But Binyamin is the Mokam Hashchina, the, the Kodesh HaKdoshim is in the chelet of Binyamin, Mamish. Uh, the outer part of the Beis HaMikdash is in the chelet of Yehuda. So Binyamin was Zeicha, primarily because of humility and other uh, midos, to be the dwelling place of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's uh, Shekhinah. And uh, exactly what that means is, again, I mean, uh, you have to understand generally, what does it mean that one makayim is holier than another? That's a big problem, right? Because Hashem's glory fills every, everywhere. Mole kolaretz kavodo. So that means God is in St. Louis, and God is in Los Angeles, and God is in North Dakota, and God is in South Dakota. So what do you mean Eretz Yisrael is holier than anywhere else? HaKadosh Baruch Hu is everywhere equally. And if he's everywhere equally, how is it shayach? that one makayim is more kadesh than another makayim. Why is the kaisel today more kadesh? Why is the makam hamikdash more kadesh? And the short answer is that the notion of holiness of makayim is not a reference to God being more in one place than in another place, but it refers to the ability of my neshama to connect to Hashem more in one place. It's like cell phone reception, right? Certain areas there is better reception than other areas. So the holiness of Makaim is the ability to receive. And therefore, that, that would be the idea that in the Chelka Shel Binyamin, there's a greater capacity to receive. That doesn't mean you're going to receive it. If your phone is shut off, you're not going to get any reception because your phone is off. So when our phone is off, <laughs> you know, we can be anywhere. I can be at the coast, right? Nothing, nothing's going to happen automatically, but at least there's, there's a capacity. Now, does that apply even today? So, that's interesting. Uh, certainly in the Makam HaMikdash it would apply, including the Kaisal. Outside of the Mikdash, in the rest of Binyamin's territory, it's not clear that you're going to have those different gradations anymore. So we don't really, we don't really know. But in the Makam HaMikdash, for sure, uh, that, that's the case. Yeah. Um, so in this week's Parsha, um, Rashi has three shots basically on what caused Yitzchak's um, blindness. Um, now just going with First one, which seems to make the most sense, because it, um, the, the passage reads, and it came to pass when Isaac um, had become old and his eyes dimmed from seeing, um, by his son of Esau, etc. Um, so Rashi explains that one shot of um, Yitzchak's blindness was that it was from the idolatrous smoke of Esau's wives. Um, so I'm wondering, how can we say that 
Yitzchak wasn't aware of the extent right. of yeah. Esau's um, wickedness. The, his wives were in Yitzchak's home serving idols, right. and if so, like, like just kick them out. Like, what do you, what do you, what do you yeah. your house for serving idols in your home? Yeah, uh, it's very, very clear that contrary to the way some people understand, some people think, oh, Yitzchak was fooled and he thought Esau was the more righteous uh, son. Obviously, that's not the case. Uh, he knew, uh, first of all, there's the smoke of Avodah Zorah. Uh, second of all, the Chumash itself says when Esau married Canaanite women, it was a bitterness for Yitzchak and Rivka. And third of all, when he says the voice is the voice of Yaakov, in the hands of the hands of Esau, Rashi says, because Yaakov uses the name of God and Esau doesn't, so Yitzchak knows that. But based on what I said before, I think you have a, you have a good approach here, and that is Yitzchak knows that Esau has a tremendous Yetzirah. And this is going to be pulling at him and dragging him down. But he feels that Esau also has the potential to overcome that. And that's why he gave him a bracha. A bracha is a crutch. In other words, Yaakov didn't need the crutch. So did so Yitzchak thought. Yaakov is a tzaddik. He'll do his job on his own. It's Esav that needs the bracha. And maybe the bracha will allow him to take the kedusha that he does have and overcome. So, so from Yitzchak's perspective, he's looking at Esav as a person that is failing. Einachinami, Esav is failing. But Yitzchak believes that Esav is still redeemable. And that's why he wants to give him the bracha. So that sounds like a good, actually that's a logical cheshman. So what did Rivka see? The short answer is, Rivka was able to see that it's too late, unfortunately. Uh, and therefore, Yitzchak had a certain utopian vision that Esav was redeemable, Esav was changeable. Esav could be misgaber over the Ra. Rivka saw, maybe because Rivka grew up in a house of deception, a house of liars. So she saw that Yitzchak was fooled. But again, I hope you understand, Yitzchak was fooled, but he was fooled in a much more subtle way. He wasn't fooled into believing Esav was righteous. But he was fooled that Esav could still change. That's a very different type of mistake. And Rivka understood that you're, you're beyond the, it's the point of no return. Uh, yeah. So um, <clears throat> it's known that when Hashem judges very righteous people, he judges them very, very strictly. For example, like Ruben, the Kumach says he's, uh, he slept with his mother, and that was really all he did was move his bed, right? And he, he, it's known that that was a tremendous, tremendous error, whereas for us it would have been nothing. Um, so with that logic, could you assume that famous Rashaim in, in Humash, such as, such as Ishmael or Esav, they really weren't that bad, but judging by the righteousness around them, Yaakov, Abraham, compared to them, they would have been bad, but maybe in our generation, they would have been normal or even... Yeah, yeah, them. yeah. Interesting question, because it is true, when we talk about the tzaddikim who do things wrong, we, we say, ah, oh, it wasn't really that bad, we didn't, uh, according to their madrega, it was bad. But it, was, it wasn't comparable to anything we would do. So the question you're raising is, well, maybe I could say that about the Esavs and the Ishmaels. So I will tell you that I once heard in the name of Rav Shvadran, uh, who was the great, great Magid of Yerushalayim. Right? If any of you have the Pesach Kron books, uh, the Magid Speaks, or the Magid, uh, a million titles with the Magid in it, the, these are things from Rav Shvadran, at least some of them. He once said that if Esav would walk into the base Medrash, you would think like the Gadol Hador, Exactly your point, is the Gadol Hador has shown up. <laughs> Meaning to say that in spite of everything, Esav was so much above our Madreka that we would actually see Kedusha in Esav, but based on having Yaakov as a father, as, as, as Yitzhak as a father, and based on his Saviva, he failed. Now, how are you going to interpret things like the smoke of the Abode You know, that's going to be very difficult because that seems to be pretty specific. But Rosh Hashodron did say, that you know, uh, we shouldn't be arrogant when we talk about how bad Esav is. Esav was very bad by comparison, but still uh, there were many, many Madregas that were higher than us. Yeah. Um, do we look at like, so after a Gadol died, right, so there's no like Lubavitch Rev, right? Or Yosef uh, Chaim Zonnefeld from here? Yeah, look at, yeah. Look at people who, who took, you know, the Shichis from Chabad, or you look at like the Karta. Um, do we look at that as like a Hassan in the Gadol? Or do we look at that as like, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the question becomes: uh, You had, you have Gedolim. You mentioned Yosef and Zanafelt, who was, he was technically not a Jewish character, but well, whatever. Uh, and the Babich Rebbe, and uh, and the followers seem to be moving in what we might think are incorrect directions. Whether it's the, uh, you know, supporting Hamas, God forbid, like, as some segments of the Jewish character are doing, I call them the lunatic segments, uh, or the idea that the Rebbe being Mashiach, which of course, even if, it, even if it's a mistake, it's a very different mistake than the, than the other one. So does that mean that the Gadol, there was a Chisarin in the Gadol, or just the followers are, are, are just being led astray? Um, again, I mean, if you're asking me this as a theoretical question, you know, it's possible there was a Chisarin, but I, I think in most cases, uh, followers just wander away. You can have the greatest, greatest, greatest Gadol, and followers can get confused, they can get mixed up, they can be led astray. They could take one central idea and run with it without realizing that you have to look at other ideas as well. I mean, a Turi Karta, for example, uh, the idea that there shouldn't be a state of Israel, although that's not my Ashkafa, certainly, but <coughs> there are sources for that, meaning that is a legitimate idea within the Messiah of Am Yisrael that we shouldn't have a state of Israel until Mashiach comes, right? So that's an idea. On the other hand, to take that idea and say, therefore, let's march with Hamas, that's an insane and even evil extension of a legitimate idea because you're not looking at other things. These are people who kill Jews. They massacre and murder uh, babies, decapitate babies. In other words, you see the problem. The problem is you take one idea that's legitimate, but you don't balance it with other considerations, and then you're going to be distorted. I've often given you the uh, parable of the seven blind men and the elephant, right? Each person, each blind person is, this, is asked to describe what an elephant is. So one guy feels the trunk. So he says, oh, an elephant is an eel. Another person feels the ears. Oh, an elephant is a gigantic butterfly. Another person feels the, uh, the legs. Oh, an elephant is like a tree, like a palm tree. Now, everybody's right, because an elephant has all of those characteristics, but everybody's wrong because they're only seeing one thing and they're not seeing the other things. That is what happens with followers of Gedolim sometimes. The followers of Gedolim take one idea and they don't consider the other ideas, and as a result, they go astray. So I would not attribute it to the Gadol per se, but the fact that followers sometimes are led astray. Uh, and you see this over and over and over again, besides your two examples, you see it uh, in Eretz Israel, all, all, I mean, in America, Eretz you see it all the time, that people will take one statement of the Gadol and they'll build a whole philosophy of life based on that one statement without taking into account other statements of the Gadol. Yeah? Why don't we pray for Tchiyas Why don't we pray for Tchiyas as opposed to our praying for Mashiach, you mean? We pray for Mashiach? We, yeah, we pray for, pray for Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, I'm not sure we... Well, how would you understand the second bracha of the Shemones, right? It, it seems like a praise. So it's, not, so it's a praise. You're, you're correct. It's not, a direct, it's, not, it's not a direct prayer, but it is a declaration to Hashem that you're Naman, you're, you are faithful in resurrecting, resurrecting the dead. I, I think the idea is that... Um, we, we want to go in stages. We do have many, <coughs> many prayers for the building of the Beis HaMikdash and uh, the coming of Mashiach, which will enable us to serve Hashem at a higher level. So we don't really pray for reward. We pray for opportunity. See, Tchiyas HaMesim is like the end reward for everything that we do. So I don't pray to God, God, give me reward. Because, you know, who are you to ask for reward? I can pray to Hashem, give me the opportunity to do all the mitzvahs that I need to do in order to be zeichet to that reward. So that would be Mashiach, and that would be Binyan Beis HaMikdash. And then, Tchiyas HaMesim will come from the Aveda that we do. But I think you don't directly pray, I mean, you don't pray for Olam Haba. You don't say, Hashem, you know, your question is not just Tchiyas HaMesim, Olam Haba generally. There is no tefillah for Olam Haba. Uh, 
Saint Socher Taif Chal Habayit Chim B'Shimcha B'Yemen. You know, it might be, but that would be a pshat. I mean, you know, the simple meaning might might literally be for Olam uh, And I and I think there's a reason for it because the Rambam says in Hilchos Shuva that the Gashmius rewards in the Torah are there to give us opportunities to do mitzvahs. They're not really reward. The sechar is Hashem will give you kalim for Avaida. So in our tefillah, we pray for those kalim. That's the meaning in Pirkei Avais, sechar mitzvah, mitzvah. The reward of a mitzvah is you'll be given kalim to do more mitzvahs, sechar mitzvah, mitzvah. So the phrase that uh, Meshulachim tell you when you give tzedakah, tisku le mitzvah. It's, it's a beautiful phrase. Tisku, may you be zaycha to do mitzvahs. So I think that would be the focus of our tefillah and all of those in Yonim. And that's why the tefillahs are primarily about Gashmias and Mashiach and Mikdash, because all of those are the conditions that allow us to do Avaida. Yeah. There, also, there are several meanings behind the word Toldos, which is the title of this week's Parsha. A yes. similar word also appears in Parsha's Breshis after the seven days of creation, alias Soldos Hashemayim Arts. I yeah. once heard someone use this word uh, in Bereshis as a, as a hint in Torah for evolution. What does Rav think of this idea of ev you know, ev evolution between the species with this word so in Told us, in other words, children. Uh, yeah. Well, again, I mean, uh, you know, I'm going to have to stop. I mean, uh, th this maybe deserves a much longer talk, and maybe next week we'll talk about it. Um, I, I'm not averse to the possibility of a theory of evolution. I, I, right, right now, I'll just quote Rav Hirsch, where Rav Hirsch wrote shortly after Darwin published uh, his book, Origin of Species. Rav Hirsch was asked, is evolution a contradiction to the Torah? And Rav Hirsch said that, number one, evolution is, was not proven. And even today, it's not proven. There are a lot of holes in it. So I, I, don't, I do not mean to endorse it even scientifically. But Rav Hirsch said, even if evolution would be proved, to a 100% certainty, he felt that it was not a steer to the Torah as long as Hashem orchestrated the process. Uh, Hashem had can do. Hashem could make things in many different ways. This might have been a way. So, I am not per se opposed to evolution as a theory. Although, as I say, scientifically there are many, many holes in it. And uh, but I think it's possible. And if it's possible, that might possibly be a remiss. But obviously, it's not uh, definitive. And there are many, many gedolim who have rejected evolution. So I wouldn't call it a raya mukrachas in that way. Okay, we'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you.